so uh, it's a very good turnout. Welcome to beautiful Tampa, the best weather in the United States over the last three weeks at least. But they call it Stormy Monday. That's what it was today. Accidents on I-4, 275, and yet everyone is still here. It took me an hour and a half to get here. Normally it would take 35 minutes. So I'm pleased to be here. Uh, what I'll, I'll be doing is giving you an overview on Parkinson's disease, uh, what we know about its cause, causes, and treatment, medical treatment, routine medical treatment, and some of the surgical treatments. Um, then uh, Dr. Robert Hauser, a colleague of mine from the University of South Florida, will be speaking about neuroprotective therapies and drugs of the future. Uh, in, in my talk, I also will cover, in a slightly different format, uh, based on questions that patients ask, uh, non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which uh, more and more individuals are uh, interested in on, on learning about. So, let's start here. It's hard to, I guess I won't be able to point very well. The angle here is about 15 degrees, so for me, it's all a blur on both sides, but I can see in front of me. And I'll just probably just, unless I, I go here at the point, yeah, I can do that. until I get restless, then I'll wander in front. Uh, so again, the overview is on the clinical features of the illness. Many of you have experienced it and understand it. We'll speak about the causes and the underlying pathology, um, what the brain looks like, what the neurons look like, what the neurochemistry of Parkinson's disease is all about, and then the treatments. Um, of course, the clinical manifestations of the illness are, appear very, very gradually, very insidiously, so subtly that one often thinks this is just a matter of getting older. Uh, every now and then there'll be a tremor, um, a little shaking of the finger even, and it goes away and one doesn't pay too much attention to it because people will tremor at different times in their lives, especially when they're stressed. And there's a little bit of slowness of movement, which again, we tend to associate just with getting older or aches and pains in your skeletal muscular system. So you might think, oh, I'm a little slower because I'm older. And the rigidity of the muscles, it's kind of echoing a bit. I'll move it down a bit. Uh, the rigidity of the muscles is something you might think is related to arthritis. And so it's often been brewing for some time before it starts to create disabilities. And usually the disabilities are doing everyday activities like handwriting. You notice the handwriting is a little bit more difficult. It's smaller. It gets smaller every year and then finally your bank wonders if you're the same person because your signature has changed so much. Uh, and then eventually one begins to lose balance. Again, something you associate with getting older. Uh, and that's called the, that's the fourth cardinal sign. So all of these four signs and symptoms are the classical manifestations of the illness. There are many other manifestations that are evident that are due to combination of slowness and rigidity. So you'll notice, for example, that individuals have decreased facial expression, like wearing a mask, almost like they're sad. They blink less frequently, for example, so there's more of a stare. Uh, and then the volume of the voice is quite low and sometimes monotonous. People sometimes begin to develop swallowing. The frequency of swallowing decreases, so there may be some drooling, especially at night. So all movements occur at a lesser frequency. So blinking is less frequent, so you tend to stare. Swallowing is less frequent, so you tend to drool. And then the very important aspect of this, 
that helps us distinguish it from other conditions that might produce tremor as well and slowness is that it begins on one side. It's unilateral in, in the beginning. It could be right or left. doesn't matter if you're right-handed or left-handed. If you're a right-handed person, you're fortunate that it will begin on the left side so that you still have good function of the dominant hands. But eventually, the illness becomes bilateral. And that's how we stage the illness. So the very first stage of the illness is the presence of signs and symptoms on one side of the body. By the time that it's on both sides of the body, it's stage two. And stage three is when a person begins to lose the balance. Stages four and five are more advanced stages having to do with difficulty in ambulation. So someone in stage four at times needs a, a walker or a cane because they have difficulty with their balance. And stage five is they can't walk even with assistance because they'll fall. So I'm going to change format. So now you get an idea of the most common manifestations and how we make the diagnosis, how a, a physician makes a diagnosis of Parkinsonism, which is a syndrome of signs and symptoms consisting of slowness of movement, rigidity of muscles, resting, intermittent tremor, and loss of balance. So two of the four cardinal signs are all that are necessary for a doctor to say, you have a Parkinson's disease-like illness. We call it Parkinsonism. Doesn't mean it's really Parkinson's disease. It just means that it's a syndrome with clinical features that are similar to Parkinson's disease. And I'll tell you more about Parkinson's disease in a moment. But we'll switch now. Just to, I like to change pace a bit. I was going to wait till the end and talk about non-motor symptoms, but then I thought it'd be really interesting to present it as questions that patients often ask. So. Patients will say, I know that, that, that Parkinson's disease causes problems with movement, but what other symptoms are there with the illness? So they, are, they include depression and anxiety, problems with the automatic body responses what, that are regulated by the, what we know as the autonomic nervous system. Um, and that includes constipation, urinary frequency or incontinence, sexual problems, like erectile dysfunction and very low blood pressure, especially noted when a patient stands up and is on their feet for a while, then they feel lightheaded. And that's called orthostatic hypotension. Then other of the non-motor <coughs> symptoms include daytime sleepiness and poor nighttime sleep. So the whole sleep cycle is, is not normal. So associated with uh, the sleep disturbances, there are nightmares, thrashing around, fighting in, the, in your sleep, talking in your sleep. So I have Parkinson's disease, and I have a hard time sleeping. Is this related to my Parkinson's disease, and how do we treat it? Well, I just told you in all of the things, not everything, by the way, but just the major non-motor symptoms, and this is one of the very, very common ones. And the severe daytime sleepiness might be not just due to the illness itself, but to the medications we use that can induce sleepiness. And many of the dopamine replacement agents make people sleepy. Mirapex or Prampexol got a bad reputation for causing what are called sleep attacks. Uh, but many of the anti-Parkinson drugs, even levodopa, carbidopa, can produce transient somnolence. But it does appear that the dopamine agonists, or the the drugs that act like dopamine, like Mirapex, tend to produce more somnolence in some people. And occasionally, uh, we prescribe modafinil, known as Provigil, to help people stay awake. And the th problem is it may induce a false sense of alertness. You feel awake, but in reality, the certain tasks weren't improved. The patient doesn't really do certain tasks well. My wife says I thrash around in my sleep and act like I'm fighting someone. And that's not an unusual um, story I hear in the clinic. Um, and one of the reasons this happens is that there's a disruption of the normal cycles of sleep. And REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep, is a phase of sleep that occurs usually at the end of a 90-minute cycle when one is almost awake 
One is tonically inhibited. One doesn't move during normal REM sleep. The eyes flutter, and that's the brain waves look like they're awake. And that's when a person dreams. But when that REM occurs out of phase, um, and there isn't muscle inhibition, people will have their dream and act it out and thrash about. That's called REM behavior sleep disorder. And actually, often antedates the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But it's am amazingly common in patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, how do you treat it? Well, some, pa some patients do well with a very low dose of ketiapine or Seroquel. It can prevent nightmares and might imp and improve sleep, and in addition will prevent uh, visual hallucinations that tend to occur more frequently on anti-Parkinson medications. Um, some patients have what is called the restless leg syndrome. It isn't, it's different than the thrashing about I described as part of the REM behavior sleep disorder. The restless leg syndrome is this need to shift positions of the limbs because of an unpleasant sensation in the limbs. So it's a response to that. It isn't completely involuntary. It's not finding a comfortable position. And so one had, often has a hard time getting to sleep. And what's usually, it's alleviated, typically, even if people don't have Parkinson's. By the way, restless leg disorder, restless leg syndrome, is seen in patients without Parkinson's disease. And the treatment is, at nighttime, before bed, a low dose of an anti-Parkinson drug. So sometimes if a patient does have restless leg syndrome, who has Parkinson's disease, I'll give them a dopamine agonist at bedtime if they haven't been already. Why do I get lightheaded sometimes when I stand up? This is, uh, or most people don't even say lightheaded. I feel dizzy. Or I feel funny in my head. I feel very weak when I stand up. And this is a very difficult complaint that people have. But generally, it's a feeling of near faint or lightheadedness when one's on stands up. And if you sit down or lie down, it goes away. Mm -hmm. Usually, we can ascertain that it's due to low blood pressure by taking blood pressure sitting and then taking it standing up after a couple of minutes of being on your feet. And if the systolic pressure, the big number, drops 20 points, that confirms the fact that you have a drop in blood pressure that's significant enough to require some kind of treatment or change in, in the way you're uh, taking the medicines. So this is partly, this drop in blood pressure is partly related to the illness itself. And we're going to talk about some of the neurochemical and neuropathology of basic, neuropathological basis of this disorder. And you already know that there's a problem in production of dopamine. But there's also a gradual loss in production of a cousin of dopamine, a related chemical called noradrenaline that is part of the autonomic nervous system and plays a very important role in constricting the heart, the, the arteries and increasing the heart rate so that when you normally stand in a healthy person, gravity pulls down blood from your brain, but automatically the art arteries supplying blood to the brain constricts just right to maintain the blood flow to the brain constantly. If you have diminished blood flow to brain, you feel lightheaded, spacey. And automatically, we don't have these changes every time we get up. But when the autonomic nervous system doesn't function normally, there's not enough norepinephrine being made. There is a sense of dizziness on 